What we have here is magnesium. And as we know, magnesium has two valence electrons, and it desperately wants to get rid of those two valence electrons. Magnesium does have a crush on some sort of air molecule out there, but it needs a little bit of courage from some friends, and that will be some heat. So let's just turn on the Bunsen burner. First off, turn everything clockwise, the barrel as well as the adjustment knob. Turn on the master valve, open this up, you'll hear that sound, and there you go. However, this, this fire is not hot enough for experiment, so I'm going to turn the barrel counterclockwise until we get a blue flame. Now again, magnesium has a crush on some sort of air molecule out there, but it needs a little bit of help, and that's why we're using the heat source over here. So the heat source is not part of the chemical reaction, it just helps start the, re the chemical reaction. Now when this lights up, it produces a very bright light, and you're not supposed to stare at it directly, at least not in person. So you're supposed to use your side vision to observe what's going on. All right, you'll see that I turned off the flame because the flame is not part of the chemical reaction. It just started the reaction. This is the chemical reaction on its own. It is not a hydrocarbon combustion because there's no hydrocarbon involved in this. Remember, it's just magnesium and some sort of gas out there. That's it. At the end of the reaction, you'll notice that you end up creating this uh, white substance, this white powdery substance. It will be very flaky and break apart, like so. Okay. So the question is, what type of chemical reaction occurred over here? And number two, what is the product that's being made over here? What I have here is some hydrogen peroxide. Again, peroxide meaning more oxygen than what naturally exists in nature. All right, the formula for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. I'm going to pour some of this H2O2 inside this test tube. Okay. Now, hydrogen peroxide naturally wants to break apart. So think about the proper chemical term for a substance liking to break apart. It will take a while. So it will probably take the entire weekend for all of this hydrogen peroxide to break down to something that's that you can drink, all right? But we don't have all the time to do that. So to speed things up, we need something called a catalyst. So a catalyst speeds up a chemical reaction. And the catalyst we'll be using today is manganese dioxide. This vial, once upon a time, was filled to the brim, and that was about 10 years ago. In fact, if I was able to recover all the manganese dioxide from all the previous student experiments, this vial would still be full. It's just that it's a very messy experiment, so we don't have the students put the used manganese dioxide back into here again. One thing to point out about catalysts is that they never get used up. And that's why, in theory, this should last for the rest of my life, the rest of your life, and the rest of your grandchildren's life. All right, so now let's speed up this chemical reaction so that we can do it in about two minutes. So I'm going to place about two rice grains of manganese dioxide into the hydrogen peroxide. And immediately, you'll hear that um, some gas is being formed. All right, I'm going to shake it about just to speed up the chemical reaction. That's all. All right. Again, the magnesium dioxide is not part of the chemical reaction. It just helps speed it up. It's like a speed dating service. It just speeds things up all right, so that the couples can get to know each other or break apart, like in this case over here. So it's a producing an invisible gas. We can't see what it is. And if I have a lit flame in here, nothing special will happen, right? So it's definitely not hydrogen. But if I smother out the flame and I have a glowing splint and I place it into this gas, you'll see that it reignites the splint over and over again. Now ignore the pop sound. That pop sound is just that the flame is so excited to be reignited that it kind of made some noise, all right? So all we're focusing on is that the gas being produced is enough to cause a glowing splint to reignite. And that is the purpose of this demonstration here. All right. So originally we had hydrogen peroxide that wants to break apart. And while it breaks apart, first off, it breaks apart to something that we can technically drink. It's just that it, this is clouded with manganese dioxide right now. But if we were to filter out all the manganese dioxide with a coffee filter, we'd have something that's drinkable in here and a gas that's formed that can reignite a glowing splint. So what is the gas that's being released here? and what is the solution being made? 
One thing just to point out, guys, is that the splint is not part of the chemical reaction. The reason why we're doing this experiment over here is to see what type of gas is being produced. All right, so the reaction is happening inside the test tube, and this is just seeing that the gas being released is enough to cause a glowing splint to reignite one more time. What I have here is zinc. Now, the way how the zinc appears, it has this weird uh, crystalline structure, and this is known as mossy zinc. So mossy zinc is rather inert on its own, but you can place the mossy zinc into acid and see what happens when it reacts with the acid. So I have some hydrochloric acid here. Again, we need to have about three milliliters of hydrochloric acid, and you can approximate it by the number of fingers that you have. All right, so three stacks of fingers is approximately three milliliters. We're gonna place the mossy zinc inside the hydrochloric acid, and immediately a gas is formed. And the question is, what is this gas that's being produced? Now, if I use a glowing splint, all right, just a splint that's only glowing, Again, this is not part of the chemical reaction, it's just used to test for the gas that's in there. You'll see that a glowing splint, nothing special happens. So we definitely know that it is not oxygen that's being produced in this chemical reaction. But if I place a glowing splint in this, oh, we hear a pop. I can build up a bit more gas, count to 10, and test it again. All right. We'll notice that there's a pop that's being generated. All right. So that's the pop test. Again, this is a reaction between hydrochloric acid and zinc. You can see that a gas is being produced, and that's the test for the gas. All right, with a lit splint, and it gives it a slightly uh, disturbing pop sound. Okay. Once again, this is not part of the chemical reaction. It is not a hydrocarbon combustion whatsoever. We're talking about the reaction over here, and we're using the splint to test for what type of gas is being produced in this chemical reaction. At the end of the day, all of the zinc would be dissolved away and we've created a solution. So what is the solution that's being produced and what gas is being liberated in this chemical reaction? Part four, take some copper strand, twirl it, so it becomes a nice straight line and can be easily inserted into a test tube. Add three to four milliliters of silver nitrate. That's about three milliliters. Let's watch and see what's going to happen. Wow, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the luster. All right. That's some very expensive metal that has precipitated right at the bottom. That's your hint. Okay. So you, cre you created this new solution. It's slightly, something has been displaced. That's your hint. For part five, we're going to combine salt water with silver nitrate. I'm gonna make some salt water right now inside this vial. So I have some sodium chloride crystals whoop, right in here. I'm just going to pour it into the vial. I think that's all I need for the experiment. Now I'll just do a little bit more just to ensure that it's a successful chemical reaction. And I'm going to add some water into it. All right, so there you go. Here is some salt water. I'm just going to shake it up just so that the crystals dissolve away. And here is salt water. You can see that salt water is transparent. What is also transparent is silver nitrate. Now silver nitrate is normally left in a dark brown bottle because silver nitrate will likely react with sunlight and it'll turn dark. And we don't want that happening. We want silver nitrate to remain transparent and that's why it's still in this vial and it's still clear. Okay, so I'm gonna put a few drops of it into salt water 
and let's see the chemical reaction that occurs. Again, right now, it's rather transparent. I know that it's hard to see that right now. We have some transparent salt water. We have some transparent silver nitrate. I'm gonna have a good serving of it. I'm gonna pour it into here and let's see what happens. Again, this is a chemical reaction between silver nitrate and sodium chloride. The question is, what type of chemical reaction occurred over here? and how can you tell that the reaction existed. To save us some time, I did this reaction yesterday and we can see what has settled at the bottom of the container of salt water. All right, those are not salt crystals, but that is exactly the white stuff that's in here. So what is the proper term used to describe the floating white little crystals that are in here? And again, if I let this sit for a number of hours, eventually all of those white little crystals will settle to the bottom of the container and it will appear transparent again.